Hello and welcome back and today we want to look at two six bay solutions from QNAP and Synology. They're both utilizing that Ryzen based processor. They're both incredibly similar but at the same time they seem to have gone very very different ways in terms of hardware and hopefully this video will help you decide which one deserves your data and you know a little bit of buttons. But before we go any further let's touch on straight away the things that both of these devices can do. We're not going to talk too much about software in today's video. I've covered DSM and QTS and QUTS in a number of different videos and I recommend you check them out. But nevertheless, it's worth touching on exactly what both of these devices can do. First and foremost, both of them do support their very own operating system that can be in GUI and software that can be accessed anywhere in the world or via the network or utilizing client applications for mobile, desktop, and more. They've both got applications for collaboration. They've both got applications for documents. They've got ones for multi-stage backups. They've both got ones for surveillance in Surveillance Station and QVR Pro. They've both got utilization for um, that virtual machine software, Synology Virtual Machine Manager, and Synology's, uh, sorry, QNAP's Virtualization Station. They both support containers. They both support Plex Media Server. They both support third-party apps like VMware. They both can utilize 4K multimedia, although neither one of them have got embedded graphics. Both of them uh, support DDR4 memory. Both of them arrive with upgradability in a number of key ways. Both of them have got M2 NVMe slots inside for caching. Both of them have just got a lot going on in a modern network attached storage device. Both arriving at very similar, although arguably slightly different price tag. They were released at different times with the Synology solution arriving in the later stages of 2020 in Q3 2020 and the TS673A there arriving at the early stages of 2021. So release difference between them of about four, potentially five months depending on where you are in the world so that's what they've got in common with a few differences between them let's talk about mainly the core differences now first and foremost very early doors we can talk about one of the biggest differences between them that you the end user are going to feel despite the fact they've both got ddr4 memory and that ryzen based processor each the Synology arrives with its own uh, its utilization of BTRFS, that file system that has the likes of file self healing. It's got support of faster snapshot creation with lesser system resource impact and faster shared folder recreation. It's got lots going on with it there. And again, BTRFS, although it isn't um, as widely utilized as ext4 it is growing uh, a great deal although they were one of the first companies in network attached storage to properly embrace the file system it has to be said that a lot of other brands have followed suit now in the QNAP the TS673A there this system arrives with ext4 and ZFS if you choose now ZFS is very much the other end of the spectrum it is a far more demanding uh, a lot one could argue resource greedy file system but again much faster performing it removes the volume layer allowing you to interact directly with the storage pool it allay, enables a number of triple parity options and it also has a lot of inline compression inline deduplication and just advantages for space saving and faster transmission built in there's a bunch of other advantages but it's worth highlighting that if I personally have to choose between ZFS and BTRFS for home, I'm not really going to mind either way. But for business, ZFS, despite being the more um, resource aggressive of the two, is probably the better, I think, in terms of general storage management. Now, price tag does, does differ between these two devices with the Synology um, DS1621 Plus arriving at around $799, give or take. I'm going to switch to dollars for this video, I think. Um, now... That figure there for a 6 by $800, and again, it will differ where you are in the world in terms of currency and tax, um, is still a lower price than the QNAP device there, arriving at around $899, and again, that will differ depending on availability, uh, currency, and tax in your local region. But given they've both got the same CPU and they're both 6 bays, it is weird that that price tag, you would think at a glance, is that different at around 100 to depending if you shop around $150. But it is worth highlighting that the architecture and what these two systems have done with the available architecture does differ a great deal. Also with that price tag, remember the release difference between them. With that Synology, that was the launch price and that price has changed slightly in the four to five months since it was originally revealed. Whereas the QNAP, that is their launch price currently. So that price may well have changed there in the future. Now I've talked about that CPU a lot. Again, it is the Ryzen V1500B. It's a quad core 2.2 gigahertz processor. 
Um, it's an, a 64-bit um, x86, so it will handle pretty much the entire gamut of what both of these brands are putting out there right now. But after that, you can see a difference on the way either of these brands has gone moving forward. So the Synology system arrives with 4 gigabytes of DDR4 ECC memory error code correction, although the, the last C does change in parlance. That memory, uh, and effectively when data passes through it, it creates a separate bit there, a checksum that it looks at after the data passes through it. And if there's any change in that data, it then can heal data as it goes through. Therefore, therefore, avoiding things like bit rot. And if there are issues and breakages in your data, these things can be addressed without you having to hands-on deal with it. Now, ECC is very much an enterprise favorite. This system arrives with four gig in a single stick and you can upgrade officially up to 32 gig with Synology only modules. Now, in the case of the QNAP and its TS673A, it arrives with eight gig of DDR4 memory, but it's non-ECC. It's a single stick and this system with that eight gig there is double that of the Synology, but some people may not like the fact that it is non-ECC. It does support ECC memory, but QNAP have chosen not to include that on the default model. On the flip side of things though, that memory can be upgraded over two slots, up to an impressive 64 gig, double that of the Synology, which for those looking at virtualization will find very, very appealing indeed, particularly with multi-user environments with big data transfers, 64 gig will go a long way in terms of smooth, multi-person or multi-application simultaneous access. Now, it's worth highlighting with that memory that although this system supports EXT4 and QTS and ZFS in QUTS Hero, the 8 gig that it arrives with is not sufficient to run the full gamut of ZFS applications. In fact, that uh, you have to upgrade to at least 16 gig to take care of some of the deduplication um, advantages and a few of the other backgroundy ZFS features. As mentioned, ZFS is a hungry beast. So bear in mind, that although you can get this device with eight gig at that eight nine nine dollars mark, it's worth highlighting that again that um, the memory inside is more likely to need to be upgraded to really take advantage of ZFS, and you have to factor that in. Now, in terms of um, further internal architecture. I've mentioned at the top of the video that both of these devices arrive with a PC, I'm sorry, an M2 NVMe upgrade slot. They've got two in each device, and both of them allow you to install super fast NVMe SSDs inside. However, again, another very, very notable difference between them. The Synology has got those two slots there, and they are PCIe Gen 3 times 4 and those slots are only to be used for caching. They can't be used for raw storage, they can only be used for caching to allow their low latency, high performance, high IOPS to be utilized in common file access and recurrent file access um, of the larger but more affordable and slower hard drive RAID array. It can improve performance internally, and as the caching burns in and learns about the system and the system you know, takes advantage of that on those frequent access files or files that, the smaller files certainly, particularly in virtualization rather than the big image files that can be moved over to the cache, that will be quite advantageous, but still nevertheless a number of you would like to see the utilization of NVMEs for raw storage pools to allow, for example, editing of files on this device over the network utilizing super fast um, NVMe, if you installed a 10 or 25 GBE card, such as available from Synology right now, and then edit on those and then use these for more general utilization, archival storage, just long-term low priority storage. Now, as good as the caching systems are in the Synology, and DSM-7 has really improved a lot of the intelligent caching in the background as it is in some of those first party apps and outside of that, the QNAP does allow those uh, M2 NVMe slots to be used for both caching and to be utilized for raw storage pools. You can put a raw storage pool on one or two uh, NVMe's there in a RAID 0 or a RAID 1 environment and then edit directly on them, which is very, very advantageous for a number of you out there that are looking to edit on a NAS and have an area on the NAS that is much, much faster to access with so you can just spend a little bit of money on a small area of N2 NVMe storage and then again, that larger hard drive array across those six bays for less prioritous 
and um, archival and long-term storage, cold storage or warm storage. And there's also uh, QNAP's own Q-tier system that intelligently moves data, not just copies it, but moves data onto the preferred tier for storage if you want to include a couple of SATA SSDs. Now, as good as that all sounds, it has to be remembered that in the case of the QNAP, those M2 NVMEs have been fractionally reduced. They are PCIe Gen 3 times one slots there. Very, very important. That means that each one of those slots cannot exceed 1000 megs. Now, you can RAID them again. So you've got a potential RAID combination there between maybe 14 to 16, 1700 megs in an ideal RAID 0 scenario. But still, you are using a trimmed down version of M2 PCIe there because of those CPU PCIe lanes and even the, the PCH ones being just spread out across the entire multifaceted hardware in this system. So as good as NVMe raw access is, bear in mind that you aren't going to be utilizing those 4,000 megs SSDs, have two of them, and then bang, 8,000 megs. You're not going to get that. You're never going to be able to exceed 2,000 megs with two SSDs in the perfect RAID scenario, and you're never really going to hit that either. So after that, we can talk about um, PCIe upgradability. Both of these options have got PCIe upgrade slots that allow you to install PCIe upgrade cards to improve network interfaces, introduce more M2 SSDs in some cases, and further upgrades as well. Unsurprisingly, the QNAP once again has gone a very elaborate and more evolved customizable route overall. With both of them arriving with PCIe Gen 3 slots, the Synology is a single Gen 3 times 8 slot, so that's 8,000 megs potential throughput between the card and the system, um, whereas the QNAP has got two PCIe Gen 3 times 4 slots. So again, two 4,000 slots versus a single 8,000 slot. Now, I don't know many cards that are going to take advantage of that connectivity. It's good that they've done that. And when we see a lot of their high-performing cards, and they've introduced some recent uh, 25G dual port cards into their portfolio there. And again, those fiber two, uh, 25G cards, again, result in a potential 5,000 megs. But there's still 3,000 knocking around. Unless you're going to install two... Um, 40 GB, uh, sorry, uh, a 40 GBE card over two ports, you're never going to max out that 8,000. And bear in mind that this is still a six bay, even if you attached two five bay expansions, filled it with SSDs, it's still going to be quite a lot of work to saturate 8,000 megs without that CPU just going, whoa, I've had enough. Um, so for me, the two PCIe Gen 3 times 4 slots. It's a lot more uh, of an open uh, area of play there. You can go for a one card that's going to be utilized for those network ports and another card that can be used for other things. And it's worth touching on there that with the Synology, as good as this system is, they largely prioritize their own range of cards. There is support of other cards out there, you know, they're, they're from lots of Intel or Mellanux, but it has to be said that the majority of the priority of their system goes towards their own cards, which are very, very good with five year warranty and all of them being PCIe Gen 3, from what I can see out there. Even the 10G card is of a high architecture. But the QNAP side introduces support of graphics cards for virtualization. They introduce uh, Wi-Fi 6 upgrade cards for private high-speed networks. They introduce further NVMe storage cards with some of the QM2 card series arriving with two and four M2 NVMe card slots on board to allow even more super fast storage access in there. And Given that each one of those slots has a potential 4,000 megs up for grabs, I think there's more that can be done there, not only in terms of the cards you can utilize, but also to saturate two 4,000 meg connections uh, cards inside than a single 8,000 megs. I think there's more ways to take advantage of the available PCIe there on the QNAP. But again, if you're not going to take advantage of them to start with, then you might want to go that way anyway so next we can talk about external connectivity on both of these devices now both of them have gone a slightly different way unsurprisingly because i don't have the 673a here in the studio i'm using that graphic there on screen but if we turn around this synology here and have the rear graphic for the qnap we can see 
that both of them have gone slightly different routes. They've both gone for the active cooling there with two fans on the rear. They've both got internal 250 watt uh, power supplies there. But after that, there is a, quite a bit of difference. We've already talked about the PCIe on these devices already. And let's talk about the USB and network connections there. So in the case of the Synology, we have got um, three USB 3.2 Gen 1 ports, so five gigabits each um, and again they can be used for external storage mostly and a few uh, appliances uh, and UPSs as well that allow you to kind of attach them and be monitored by the system but predominantly they're external storage there aren't that many USB network adapters for 2.5G and 5G supported officially by Synology unofficially you can jerry-rig the system to accept them but again unofficially might lead to an unsupported warranty, you never know. Um, on top of that, you've got four LAN ports there, one GPE each. So again, they could be link aggregated or use load balancing or failover, but ultimately mean up to 100 to 109 megs per port or a combined 430, 440 megs top end um, saturation if you link aggregate them together. And lastly, you have got the two eSATA ports there that are used for the expansions, the JBOD DX517, allowing you add, uh, to add a potential 10 more bays of storage to this device, hence the 16 in the title. Now, in the case of the QNAP, slightly different there. With the QNAP, we find that not only has it got better network ports per port, so it's 2.5G per port. So rather than four ports, it's two ports. But each one of those ports, again, could be link aggregated. So a potential 250 megs, give or take. Um, and again, it's slightly over with network protocol, but can be combined to uh, over 5GBE or 500 to 530, 540 megs or so with the perfect saturation. It's whether a question if you would prefer many, it's again, quantity versus quality there, and it very much depends on your own hardware architecture. The USB ports on this QNAP as well, are you, uh, there are, there's one USB 3.2 Gen 1 5G port, but there are three USB Gen, uh, USB Gen 2 times 2 10G ports there. So again, these are used for the expansions, of which there are many. They are used by supported peripherals. And if you install a graphics card with HDMI out, you can create a KVM setup there. I think they've done more in terms of hardware architecture, but both those USB ports and the um, uh, 2.5 GBE ports, as good as they are, they do still depend on you, the end user, having architecture outside the device to take advantage of them. So right now, it gives you a lot more for your money, but again, you need to have a more evolved structure to take advantage of them, which may be a big part of your decision-making process. And that's really it. The only, I mean, they both arrive with three years of manufacturer's warranty that can be extended, and they both include uh, effective lifetime support warranty um, on the software, although the hardware, of course, again, three to five years with an extension. Personally, between them, I do think the 1621 Plus, as good as the Synology is, and certainly a giant old leap over that Intel Atom predecessor, I still think they play a little bit safe with regards to those uh, 1GBE LAN ports there. It's a good system, and I think as far as the software, the software really makes it a decent enough purchase on its own. But as a combined hardware-software solution, I think the QNAC gives a little bit more. Although its software isn't quite as intuitive and slick as Synology, they do make up the difference a great deal more in terms of hardware, and their software is still very good. A little bit more of a learning curve, but that QNAP there does bring a lot for your money there. And although it does have the higher price tag, there's still the, uh, the inclusion of ZFS, there's still the inclusion of more memory, a larger potential memory, larger network connectivity, more PCIe slots, better USB, and you just seem to be getting more value for your money. So I hope this video has helped you decide which one of these two deserves your money and your data. Do let me know which one you think you're going to go for. Click like if you've enjoyed the video so I know that this is the sort of stuff that you guys like. And of course, click subscribe to learn more as we talk about more and more network attached storage in 2021. There's a link in the description to a full article on today's um, uh, NASIS that we talked about today. And if you want to learn more, you need a bit of help in your next network solution, use the free advice section on NAS Compares. It's just myself manning it. I'm not going to say it's the quickest, but I will be able to help you with some impartial advice. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.